Hello, I'm Jeremy Parrish from US Gamer, and I'm here to talk about the Nintendo Famicom Disk System on its 30th anniversary. It turns 30 February 30, 21st, uh, 19... Well, no, it was launched in 1986. 2016 is this year. And um, if you're not familiar with the Famicom Disk System, it was a peripheral for the Japanese version of the Nintendo Entertainment System that was released only in Japan. And it was actually the kind of origin point of a lot of really familiar and beloved games. The system launched with The Legend of Zelda, uh, to where Metroid got its start, Castlevania, Kid Icarus, uh, quite a few others. There were, there were some unique games that never came to America, like Otoki and uh, The Mystery of Murasame Castle. Uh, just a lot of really kind of interesting and entertaining games, uh, some of which made it west, some of which didn't, but the ones that did make it over here were slightly different. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Famicom Disk System and a little bit about some of the games uh, that, that you know, but which have slightly different versions on the Disk System. So uh, if you open up the, or start up the system attached to the Famicom, but don't have a disk inside, you get this screen where Mario and Luigi act very aggressive toward one another. It's very strange. They're very defensive about this uh, Disk System switch. <clears throat> but you'll continue to see them run back and forth and be jerks to each other until you plug in a disc, and I'm going to do that now. Uh, I'm leaning close to the system so you can actually hear the physical action of me putting a disc in. So it's a, you know, a diskette like on an old computer from the 80s, except there's kind of a sort of a springy physical element to it. And we're going to start out here with The Legend of Zelda, which you probably recognize. Uh, the title screen obviously is a little bit different. Um, instead of playing, playing, saying press start at the bottom though, it tells you to insert the B side of the disc. And uh, <clears throat> Zelda is interesting because the, uh, the A side of the disc has some game data on it, but when you initially put it in on side A of the disc, the first side, uh, you just see this demo, the introductory demo, uh, play over and over. And if you listen, If you listen to the music, you can hear that it's different than the American music. Uh, there's different sounds to it. There's like a bell or something like that. And uh, that's because the Famicom Disk System gave the Famicom an extra sound channel that was never reproduced on American systems. So uh, that's, that's something that was kind of a selling point for the system and something that the NES couldn't reproduce because of the hardware design. But anyway, I've popped the disc out, hit the eject button, and switch over the disc to the other side, and put it in, and you get this message telling you to wait. And uh, here you go, you've got a, a very familiar save screen. This is all saved to the diskette, just like the American cartridge saved with a battery. And uh, this is a disc I picked up in Japan, so some kid, I'm sure, a long time ago played a lot of this game, actually. I mean, he's got both save files. Two of them have uh, blue rings. One of them has the red, red ring and full hearts, so he's ready to take on Ganon with only six deaths. It's pretty impressive. One of them is on the uh, second quest mode, and his name is not Zelda. It's Ishu Tobaso. So whatever, whoever that is, Ishito Basho is, uh, Basso is ready to take on Ganon the second time around. Well, actually, he's only like halfway through the game. Anyway, it's um, pretty much the same, except, you know, with Japanese text. And the file delete mode is called kill mode, which obviously Nintendo of America did not reproduce. So um, let's jump in and, and check out the kill mode, see what happens when I kill someone. I don't know if you could hear it, but the, uh, the disk system just clunked in the background. So let's see, shoot, shoot. Well, let's, let's call up this guy, Jun Ichi, who has been the least serious about playing this game. Goodbye, Jun Ichi. So now I get to add my own name. Let's name this brave hero U S G. And I'm done there. So another wait screen. There's a lot of this with Famicom Disk System. 
It's definitely different than the NES where you had cartridges which had pretty much instantaneous loading. So we're going to jump down to USG and it's pitiful zero, uh, zero, well actually good zero deaths, but pitiful three hearts. Hmm, more wait time. How about that? So this is pretty much as you expected. It's, you know, The Legend of Zelda. The music's the same. You'll hear different sound effects. Um, the, the text is different. It's like a skinny font in Japanese for some reason. It's sort of the big, thick American font. And uh, this old dude's word balloon is centered or kind of offset over his head as opposed to centered in the middle of the screen. Uh, I get the sword and can resume my adventure stabbing things very very bravely. That's what Link does. Everything in the overworld is, as far as I know, laid out exactly the same as it was on NES. Like, they didn't change any of the locations. I don't think they rebalanced the difficulty. Everything hits as hard as it did, takes as many hits. You have the same progression of equipment and gear. Everything's in the same locations and dungeons. I mean, they had the game pretty much the way they needed it, right from the start. And... So, really playing Zelda in Japanese is a very familiar experience. Um, eventually they released, oops, got hit. They released uh, a cartridge version of the game in 1994 when the revised uh, second version of the Famicom came out, which looked just like the second version of the NES, the top loader model. Um, that, that launched in Japan in 94. Wow, I'm really sucking it up here. Uh, and... Uh, that was s sort of as the uh, the way Zelda was the launch title for the Famicom Disk System. Um, so Zelda was the launch title for the revised model Famicom. Anyway, so I've entered a dungeon, and once again, there's loading time. Pretty lengthy black screen. Uh, but as you can see and hear, it, it all sounds exactly the same. And even some of the same tricks work, although the bit with you ducking out of the dungeon and then ducking back in in order to unlock the door is a lot less practical in the Japanese version because, I mean, after all, there's extra loading time, and uh, that's kind of a pain in the butt. So uh, some of the exploits are less fun in, uh, in the Japanese version of Zelda. I know there are a few minor differences in terms of layout in some of the dungeons. Like there's a couple of rooms with slightly different arrangements of enemies, fewer enemies in the Japanese version, but I mean, the, the differences are really so modest that you would really have to go over the game with a fine tooth comb in order to see what's changed. I know some of the sound effects are different though. I'm actually wearing uh, headphones where I can't hear the game music myself, so uh, I, I can't actually comment on what's different and what's not. But um, just, just some subtle differences, subtle variations. Uh, I'll try to get up to the boss because apparently the bosses have very different sound effects. So let's just cruise on up there. Get past these guys. Let's get past these guys. Or kill them, I guess it makes no difference. Oh, wrong way. Be curious to know what that guy says. I don't know Japanese well enough to just be able to read it and translate off the cuff, but you could check out the book Legends of Localization, which gives you a comprehensive breakdown of every single line of dialogue in the Japanese game and uh, how it compares to the American translation. For my part, though, I just want to beat some bad guys. Beat a dungeon, see what happens. Then we'll move on to a different game. This is not the way to the boss, though, so screw that. I 
since they're on the way, I might as well grab the boomerang from them. Wow, I got bombs before boomerangs. Sort of random thing that can happen in the Japanese and American versions of the game. And I need to go grab that key before the wall, master gra wall masters grab me. So let's listen to the sound effects on the boss, because I believe Aquamentus has different sound effects. Yep, slightly different. You really have to... Uh, it sounds different from what I can hear, I don't know. I don't want to make a definitive statement, but uh, I believe it's slightly changed. But as you can see, the whole dungeon is exactly the same, and that's basically the experience of Zelda on Famicom Disk System. It's the game you know, but some loading times, and Japanese words. And of course different music on the, uh, the title screen. So having shown off the first dungeon of The Legend of Zelda, I'm going to go ahead and uh, eject the disc. The disc read light is off, so it's safe to take the disc out. Uh, it's kind of crazy to remove a game disc while the game is running, but I believe it continues running until you uh, until you hit a point where it has to load new data. Like, I think if I were to go back into the dungeon, the game would crash. Or just, yep, there we go. Disc get set, error one. So let's turn off the disc system from the Famicom. And so we're relaunching into the, uh, the title screen. And this time we're going to try a different game, but also one that you'll find familiar. This is, well, we'll see. Every game has that uh, sort of BIOS screen of the copyright. Ah, uh, here we go. Akumajo Dracula, aka Castlevania. So, a uh, different title screen has the film strip motif. What it doesn't have is a game demo. The American version, if you let it sit on the title screen long enough, uh, you would see the title, and then it would start to show you a game demo, show you how to play the game, show you some, not really secrets, show you how to play badly, but just kind of give you a, a glimpse of what the game action was. This one just gives you this very, very short uh, title screen, and then it resets and rolls the film out again. That's lame. So let's push, this, push the start key. And oh, this is different. Instead of just starting, the game actually has a, uh, a save screen. And it's just it works just like Zelda. It's got a um, name register and name kill, uh, although instead of saying kill, it says kesu, but it's the same thing. Um, so there are two save files that were already here, and one that I've gotten about halfway through for Retronauts. So instead of starting from the beginning, I'm actually going to start from, I believe, World 4, 4 1, or whatever it's called, Block something. Uh, but as you can see, to be able to play, I have to switch the disc around again. So a well-designed game doesn't force you to switch the disc around very often, uh, but there are some really badly designed Famicom Disk System games that... Uh, kind of cram that down your throat. In terms of um, actual design, Castlevania is not that different in Japanese than it was in America. Like, those guys are still jerks. I think everyone hits the same. Castlevania 3, there's a big difference in uh, damage values for enemies, but that's not really the case with this one. Well, that was a bad idea. Okay. As you can see, it's crazy hard, and I still make stupid mistakes. So, um, yeah, the big difference really with Castlevania is that um, the... Uh, wow, what was I doing? I guess I should pay attention instead of just talking. Um, it has the save feature, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else different. Like, some minor graphical alterations were made for America. But I don't think the music's any different. I could be mistaken, but let's let me stop talking and you can just enjoy the the game for what it is. Thank you. 
Uh, I guess that you can only enjoy the game so much if I'm constantly dying while I'm trying to show it off. But anyway, that's Castlevania. It's pretty much the same thing, just with some small, small differences that um, make it feel a little different. But it's still familiar and still really hard. So I'm going to pop this one out also. And I'm going to, instead of turning the system all the way off, I'm just going to put in another disc and reset. So if I can get this disc card open. The uh, Disk System games came in uh, very, very elaborate packaging. Um, there's this sort of acetate sleeve that surrounds everything, and then inside of that you have a manual that's separate from the hard plastic acrylic case where the game disc is stored. And the game disc storage cases have a um, like a paper sleeve, and then inside of that there's a wax paper sleeve that is uh, meant to protect the diskettes and kind of prevent them from getting dust on the, the magnetic media. Anyway, I'm going to reset, and we're going to launch into another game. And this game should have no errors because I opened it up brand new for the first time uh, in almost 30 years of its existence, a copy of Metroid. If you're familiar with the American version of Metroid, then you definitely recognize the uh, fact that this music is different. Uh, but the message that it gives you is pretty much the same. And the music, like the, the sound of the music, is identical to, uh, like the, the not the, the sound, but the um, composition of the music is identical to the American version. It's just a different arrangement. So I'm starting in a save file that I've been playing already for Retronauts. And uh, it's most of the way through the game, actually. I, I've beaten Ridley, but not Kraid. And uh, this one is not making me switch over the disc side, which is nice. I think Metroid takes place... I don't think it's entirely on one disc side. Oh, there we go. Okay. That does make me change. So it loads the... Um, I think it loads the game data, and then you switch over for the map and graphic data. I could be mistaken on that, but that would make the most sense. So yeah, playing Famicom Disk System games involves a lot of looking at these please wait I'm loading screens. So it's kind of like a foretaste of the CD-ROM era. So my game takes quite a while to load. So let's see where I am. Oh, I'm here at the beginning. So I don't know if you can hear it, but the sound effects, they're very different. Like the sound of the ice beam there has kind of like this swishing sound as opposed to the sort of blaster noise it makes in America. Um, enemies make a different noise when they explode. None of these are substantial changes, but um, they are changes nevertheless. Oops. going to emerge into Craid's area. The Just like with Zelda, the layout of Metroid is identical to, uh, to that of the NES version. Uh, this screen is now a loading screen. The, uh, the, this might be the, the originator of the elevator loading screens. Mass Effect owes so much to Famicom Disk System on Metroid. Huh. Um, anyway, yeah, the layout of the game is the same, the enemy damage values, the enemy placements, the weapon and item placements, 
they really didn't change too much in terms of content when they were localizing these disk system games into the NES region versions um, for cartridges. So the only changes they made were really just sort of the essential changes um, to make up for the fact that the disk system had some capabilities that the NES did not. Uh, so this game, like like Zelda, wow, that was cheap. All right, so I won't go that way. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, in Japanese, this version, like the uh, like Zelda, has a save file system. Uh, in America, of course, it did not have a save file or battery system. Instead, it had a password system, which was a giant pain in the butt to uh, input into your, your system. Uh, it was like 24 characters, and a lot of the letters and numbers looked almost identical, so really not all that fun. But um, what can you do? Fortunately, Zelda did not have a password system in America, so we were not forced to uh, to input a bunch of passwords every time we wanted to play Zelda, which is good because that game was much more complicated than Metroid and probably would have uh, that probably would have killed the experience. I don't know why they didn't put a battery in Metroid and Kid Icarus. Uh, I'm sure it was a cost-saving feature, but it would have been nice to have been able to just you know save the game and not have to worry about uh, memorizing passwords or writing down passwords and inputting them and getting them wrong. Anyway, um, you should get the idea of what's going on here with Metroid. Um, I suppose I could show off a game that is different from, or not different, but was never released in America. I find it in a stack of games. Uh, it's called Toki. There are retronauts on this recently, but uh, I'm going to show you really quickly how it works uh, in real time. So plug that in, reset the system. So Otoki is interesting. It's a game designed by uh, Toshio Iwai, who was the... Oh, this one tells me to set side B right away. No fooling around there. Uh, he was the creator of Electroplankton, a fine, and, uh, fine artist in the sort of uh, creative sense. And uh, you can choose any level you want. Uh, I'll just show you level one because why not? Anyway, UI um, was kind of a multimedia artist and this was one of his first projects, his first published project actually. Anyway, Toki is a music-based game, so the uh, So the idea here is that you are playing music as you attack enemies and try to grab try to grab notes to fill a meter at the bottom of the screen. I'm also bad at grabbing the A button icons. Um, anyway, so there's not really background music to the game. You're sort of sort of creating it as you play. Every time you take a hit from an enemy, your uh, the little ball you're throwing uh, becomes smaller, and when it's become tiny, totally tiny, you die. So try not to do that. Someone wants to die in a video game. Um, if I can get an A icon, there we go. That changes the nature of the music. That was cheap. Do. 
but as you uh, gain upgrades for your weapon, change the nature of the music, um, you gain the ability to fire multiple shots at once. And you do have sort of a secondary weapon that you can use. Oh, I'm gonna die. Yeah, that's it for me. So I'm trying to fill the meter at the bottom with notes, and it uh, looks like I'm probably not going to be able to finish the level before I, I die horribly, which is a shame. Look at how tiny that little ball is. So I'm really close to getting to the boss, I just have to fill the meter. Keep missing the notes. There we go. Got my last note, so now we move on to the boss. Anyway, um, Kotoki is interesting because it's just a really unique kind of video game, and it was one that was really made possible by the Famicom Disk System. Um, the Famicom Disk System added an extra audio channel to the hardware, and uh, it also had more storage space than cartridges. So developers could, you know, make use of improved sound capabilities, not just the extra sound channel, but they could also afford to have more sampled sounds uh, for the NES's... Uh... Oh, so sad, I died. Anyway, for the NES's uh, built-in sampling channel. So, um, you know, there weren't a lot of games that were just totally like, oh, why didn't this come to America? the Famicom Disk System, but there were a few, like Otoki and Arumana no Kiseki, which is a kind of Indiana Jones adventure by uh, Konami, who was definitely in their prime back in the, the late 80s. Um, so all in all, the, uh, the Famicom Disk System is a pretty interesting little bit of history. So if you're interested in knowing more about it, you can check out the Otoki episode of Retronauts, and you can also check out uh, the feature that's running on US Gamer to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Famicom Disk System. So check out usgamer.net and uh, look for the Famicom Disk System retrospective. Hope you enjoyed this look at a little slice of obscure video game history. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>